Hey there, folks. This is Kevin Madison from Project Dragonfly. I hope you enjoy this podcast about Dragonfly community members doing inspiring work. If you have ideas for a guest or want to be more involved in this podcast, please feel free to directly email me. Thanks again for listening and enjoy the episode. This episode, I had the pleasure of meeting with Agnes Kovacs. Agnes is the Senior Manager of Graduate Programs at the Chicago Zoological Society Brookfield Zoo, and she has multiple decades of educational experience. She's done tons of work at the Brookfield Zoo with school groups, teacher workshops, graduate classes, field trips, and has seen literally thousands of adult and um, child students come through the various programs at the Brookfield Zoo. For those of you that don't know, the Brookfield Zoo, Chicago Zoological Society, was in the very first year of the AIP, the Advanced Inquiry Program. And that was back in 2010. So as it is now 2023, we're coming up on the 15-year anniversary next summer of that program. Um, And they were the first zoo along with the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden uh, to join the program and the AIP all those years ago. At one point in the interview, in the discussion, um, we did, we start estimating the number of students in the program and Agnes later got back to me. There have been 255 graduates from the AIP program in Chicago. It's absolutely amazing to see that size and number and, and um, overall impact in the area. And that includes 24 employees and four volunteers. So in this conversation, Agnes shares a lot about her perspectives about the program, what she's seen that she loves and um, has been inspired by. And um, I hope you you enjoy it and you uh, get something out of it. So without further ado, please enjoy this episode. Okay. Agnes, welcome to the podcast. Thank I'm you. so glad to yeah, talk with you. So I thought we would start off just hearing about what's happening with Chicago Brookfield Zoo AIP this fall semester. What kind of classes are you offering? What kind of experiential learning is happening? And anything else you want to share about it? Uh, this fall, we have several classes that are, are always fun and exciting. We have Plants and People this fall, which is a class that focuses on plants and people and the relationship they have with each other. So I'm looking at some of the effects of climate change and how the decline in insects and, and those types of things are affecting uh, plants. And of course, plants affect people in a, in a huge way. The course also does a field trip to uh, McCormick Place Roof Garden, because one of the topics that we talk about in the class is our roof gardens. And so we visit a roof garden, which happens to be on the roof of McCormick Place, which is just, it's in the middle, it's it's in the middle of Chicago. And so it's thinking, whoa, we have actually a, a roof garden there. So it's really fun to see there and, and do some talking about what happened, why the roof gardens are important, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have several guest speakers coming in who are experts in their field. We've had uh, a Dr. Kevin Madison, Madison, <laughs> um, who did a wonderful job talking Who's about that guy. Stuff. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> uh, and he was great. Talked to the uh, students about bees. And of course, bees are critical to plants that we eat and and they do so many things. And then another guest speaker was Nikki Kuranich. Am I even close? Kucherov. 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 I knew I was telling that one. Um, Mm -hmm. She's also uh, doing her PhD in insects. And so the courses have experts in the field as well as face-to-face contact with the experts. Many of, most of the courses have field trips where we're actually going out and looking um, at what we're talking about in person. So the classes are just always busy and exciting and and full of new information. Well, I want to, so McCormick Place, I've heard of it. I think I've seen pictures of the green roof. I don't know if it's a, is it a government building or, but it's, I think it's, yeah, in the Chicago Loop, you were, right? You were saying, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It must be so cool to get up there um, with the students. Have you, have you already been there? Um, Yes, yes. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, um, yeah, it's, you just standing this really tall roof and you look around and one of the things that strikes you is Chicago has so many green roofs, not mm. necessarily a full garden, um, but trees and plants and, and big planters. And um, there's a lot of green going on in the, in the Chicago area with uh, the little space that Chicago has, a little green space that Chicago has. Right. Yeah. A while back I did in my work in New York City, I looked at Manhattan and it was like maybe 30 percent of the land area of Manhattan is building footprints, which means essentially building mm -hmm. rooftops. Right. And so if you think about that amount of space that could be used for green roofs, and there's, of course, challenges of what plants can actually thrive on a green roof and um, what insects might make it up there, birds. Um, but it's kind of this new area of study in urban yeah. ecology that I'm fascinated in. Well, and, and surely it's, it's going to be a whole new adventure for architects because mm -hmm. um, soil and water is heavy and yeah. not every roof is even made for the possibility of a green roof. But as, as they become more uh, important to our society and, and more, uh, more a known thing to do, architects are going to have to make some changes too. So it's, it's mm -hmm. a big, it has a big implication. Yeah, very cool. And then the um, I really did enjoy the guest lecture via Zoom about, you know, and it's perfect for my research background being with having done work with University of Illinois Chicago and a postdoc there and, and pollinator work. And I feel towards Chicago Brookfield Zoo, kind of how I feel towards WCS in New York and Bronx Zoo, because I have these connections to both of these places through my research. So it's always fun to reconnect and kind of like for me, hearing the students ask questions and hearing about the bees they're seeing and the pollinators they're seeing in the area and their questions about plants and people. So it's really cool. Um, and I also like that you did the insect apocalypse as your, um, mm. I think is sort of like an area of a theme area for the course and trying to understand that whole thing. Cause I think it's on a lot of people's minds and it's getting press. And so I don't know, how are the students responding to that in your in your observation, like, are they, are you guys doing any specific readings related to that or? Yes. Yeah. There's so much out there now that's possible to, to give to the students on that because it is such a current thing. And I think it's, it, for me, I'm always interested in how many students aren't aware. Um, in, in our environmental steward class, we cut buckthorn one afternoon mm. because buckthorn's invasive and part of our stewardship to the, to the planet. So I'm, always a stun, just stunned. But how many students say, I have never seen buckthorn. I don't know what it is. And I think that the same is happening with insects. You know, we hear about the polar bears and, and the and the big carnivores that are um, the keystone. But there's a whole lot of people who still don't realize that insects are critical and they're on the decline. So I love students saying, wow, I've learned so much. And geez, I didn't know that at all. And man, I'm going to really rethink what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. So it's it's just, um, it's just for me, really enriching to see students grow and learn about things like this. It is one of the things with the biological world. You can never, you know, even if you're getting a master's or you have a, maybe you have a biology background and you're, you've always watched, you know, planet earth videos and such, but still there's, there's always more to learn. And mm. I feel like you're right. Like there might be areas that you, you, maybe, you know, about somewhat insect declines, but you might not know about like muscle, freshwater muscle declines or songbird issues going on. Um, or even like paleoecology and like dinosaurs, the things, um, right. yeah, there's just so many fascinating things. And it's really, it's, it's both fun. It can be overwhelming a little bit too. Yeah. I don't know. Do, do you find that the students in the program in the AIP with, with Brookfield Zoo in Miami, like, do you feel that they come out more focused or less focused because they've been <laughs> exposed to all these different so much. things? Um, I, I feel like their master plan really mm -hmm. helps them focus. And and for folks who don't know what the master plan is, the master plan, every it's a graduation requirement. Um, my tagline is no test, no desk, no thesis um, for the AIP program because students don't have to do a thesis, but they have to do a master plan, which in my mind is unique and amazing and more meaningful because that's a master plan is they have to find um, an area that they are 
and I use the word passion, um, they, they find an area that they're really passionate about and they want to make a difference. And how are they going to make that difference? Um, and they spend a lot of their time uh, thinking about that master plan, researching the master plan, doing action steps towards that master plan, making a difference in their community. And so I think that really focuses them, not not narrowly less necessarily, because their research is is broad based and you know how things are connected and interconnected. So their research is broad based, but they're really focusing on how they can contribute to sustainability and conservation. Uh, and being a, a conservation leader in their community. And so I think that's the focus that the program gives students. Yeah, no desk sounds pretty good, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, many of us are like, oh, I want to sit and be lectured at. No test also sounds good. No thesis. Writing and doing a thesis is like so much work. But but it is kind of a tricky thing you're saying there because they don't have those three things, but they have this master plan, which can right. also take, like you said, the, all the planning and different elements it takes. Are there some examples that you have seen of master plans or, or projects that you thought like were just so creative or interesting, even just general ideas that students might have um, done through the program? There's so many wonderful master plans that, I, that I've seen students do. Um, I had a student who her family had uh, has uh, a restaurant and she was interested in all the food scraps that the restaurant mm. had. And it was also a brewery and there's a lot of hops that are that are a byproduct of uh, making beer, of course. And so she did her whole master plan around um, food, con the conservation of and, and the uh, what to do with food scraps. And she did all kinds of training. She went out to elementary schools and did uh, food measurements with the students on what they were throwing away. And then she took it the next step and said, OK, now, if we were going to throw this away, what if we divide it between recyclable food scraps um, and, and broke it down into the various, you know, true trash? Uh, and then they weighed each of that. Um, she actually managed through a lot of work. Uh, she went to the city council and the whole city council uh, put in a program where their trash haulers had to also offer food scrap collection for decomposing. I mean, she's, she has just changed so much because of her passion about we're, what are we going to do with that? We can't just put all this food scraps in landfills. There's, there's a better way. Uh, and, and so she has made just a, such a huge difference. Um, a student who uh, was in love is in love with bats, and um, <laughs> you know, it's like some it, people come in with these amazing loves. And she has uh, started several groups via uh, the internet on supporting bats. She has uh, started developing products for sale, and the money goes towards bat co bat conservation organizations. Again, all kinds of education with school groups and seniors about um, how important bats are. Oh, I have one that just went through my mind. Oh, I had another person come in day one saying, I love orangutans. That That's mm -hmm. my passion. And we hope that the master plan is a, is a local focus. And so I said to her, I'm, I'm so thrilled that you love orangutans and, and that's your passion. But I don't have orangutans in my backyard and I don't think you do either. How are you going to make this local? So she thought for a little bit and said, ah, palm oil. It's educating mm. the people about palm oil. And so she has done amazing things with educating people uh, about palm oil, um, educating the docents at our zoo about messages that they can give to our guests around palm oil. And so the students, some of them come in and say, I haven't got a clue. I, I don't know. And so they they have time to think about it. And as they take a f their first few, first few courses, what draws you? Where's your focus there? And some of them come in day one saying, boy, I know exactly what my passion is. So it's just really fun to see students grow into a passion and or to take something that they love and, and really making a difference in that area. I remember hearing about uh, years ago, I think one of the years that I came out for your lovely graduation event in January or December. And um, the students were talking about their master plans. And one of them, I think, had done something with, and it may have been the same student with the composting um, or food scrap collection, but it was like some initiative to collect pumpkins during Halloween because yes. yes. they're huge and yeah. heavy and they they start to rot. 
and people are just throwing them in the trash, depending on the city, they may not have access to a place to compost it in their backyard. And that just struck me as such a unique like project that's saving thousands of pounds of waste going to the landfill. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But the complexity of making it happen with a municipal, I don't know if it was with the city of Chicago or if it was with like a suburb of Chicago or where, but. Suburb, yeah. Yeah. Um, still, hugely, uh, I know how much little things like that can take just like. Getting oh, yeah. It sounds so through. simple. Let's collect pumpkins. Yeah. But yeah. making that happen is like, whoa. Yeah. Let's collect pumpkins. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um. So what's. Uh, it's been over 10 years uh, since our first, Chicago our first, yeah. Zoo. Our first cohort was in 2010. Yeah. It's so 13 years. Uh, wow. 13 years. And yeah, 14th class for this 2024 mm-hmm. summer. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we should celebrate that. But and when we get to 15, or it might be a good one too. <laughs> um, but what's it been like for you kind of seeing the AIP grow and change and with your role at the zoo? Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of the things you've noticed? Well, I'm in love with teaching adults. I, mm. I except especially graduate students because they know why they're there. It's not like teaching high school seniors and chemistry. Uh, these are students who uh, are mature and bring a background with knowledge and um, know why they want to be there. So I have just grown a lot personally, um, listening to them, uh, helping them grow. If anything that I can find that helps them also helps me in terms of my ability to do research, my ability to get to students what they're needing, um, their enthusiasm is just contagious. I just, in class, they just, I love watching them just light up and ask questions and uh, talk about the readings that we've done. So it's been personally growthful for me. That's my own word, growthful, by the way. Uh, I make yeah, that up. I like it. it. But it's it's for me also a very growing experience, a very positive experience. I um I I just feel myself engaged with all these wonderful people and learning from them. And what a wonderful opportunity to learn from 30, 40 people every semester. Yeah, totally. I I completely agree. I, I love it as well. And I, I think it's also like a unique time period because you've got you, your your passion is there and your focus is right, like you said. Um, and actually, my son is the the senior in high school right now taking chemistry, and we're <laughs> trying to find a way to motivate. Um, but so Dragonfly is full of people who are at this great stage of wanting to learn, but then also have the complexity of their lives and sometimes like you know having kids or a family or someone yeah. they got to take care of. I mean. What about that? Have you have you found this program is is doable for? I mean, obviously, I work with it too, so I know it's it's mm-hmm. it's achievable. But I guess, like, what kind of things have you noticed with students, like balancing their lives in the program? Well, if the, if the student is really wanting the program to fit for their life, then mm. it's so doable. I have had everything from very early on. I had a student coming in with four kids. Mm. And she was the main bread reader, bread winner for the family. Uh, the The husband was the stay at home mom, um, and so the roles were very different. And and she was just dedicated to the program. Accidentally got pregnant with their fifth child while she was in the program. Still finished in the three and a half years. It was like wow. whoa, and an amazing student. I mean, just straight A's all the way through. Um, students, I have a student who. Uh, moved to this area because she was caring for two very ill, uh, aging and ill parents. Um, And she had to take a semester off, which is perfectly okay, because they have up to five years to finish the program. Uh, The classes uh, are often on Saturdays, so that they don't have to take off work. Uh, Some some are in the summer and they need to take off work. But again, it's so doable. Things they know all the dates in advance for class meetings. I set my October twenty four. Um, I set my twenty twenty four dates in October of this year, so they, you know, they know what's coming. They can plan around it. So it's 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 more flexible, I think, than most programs are. Um, they have uh, they have only eight hours that are required 
from the Web Plus classes. And so the rest of the 21 required hours are electives. So yeah. again, just flexibility in what they take and when they take it and um, the hours they put into it. Uh, it's it's in May, it's amazingly flexible. Yeah, it's almost like when time is more scarce, it can help you see things if if you can focus. And I know it's easier said than done. But you know, when I think about the undergraduate experience where you have oh. nothing, you just have studying, right? Yes. And classes, right. but you're also at an age where you've kind of still got some things going on with like fleshing out your identity, or you may have other things you're working on in your social spheres. And so I think for some people, undergraduate, um, or I've heard from some students in this program, like undergraduate was not like the eye-opening intellectual thing mm -hmm. that they that that they might have hoped and that going back to school later on kind of hopefully becomes that. I uh, also want to ask you, um, just going back to when you said how much you love teaching adults now, um, did you teach, like, what is your background as an educator going before the AIP? Um, can you just share a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, about 100 years ago, um, I got <laughs> my undergrad degree in elementary ed, um, and I taught elementary ed for uh, in, in, the, in the classroom for four years. And then I got my master's in early childhood ed and went into early childhood ed. But at the same time, I started teaching classes at the graduate level um, in, in early childhood ed classes, but teaching uh, graduate students. Um, and I, I truly realized that graduate students are just amazing because by and large, they know why they want to be there. They want to learn. They want to participate. Um, and they have reasonable expectations of what you need to bring to the classroom. Um, so I, I have done a lot of teaching on the college level. When I came to Brookfield Zoo 16 years ago, uh, one of the things I was in charge of was our teacher education. And so, again, just fell right into that adult training. Um, and then um, 16, 17 years ago, Miami knocked on our door and said, <laughs> hmm, we think you might want to be a part of our program. And it was just this perfect wedding between the philosophy of Miami and Dragonfly and the philosophy of Brookfield Zoo in terms of uh, helping adults learn about sustainability and conservation and um, the needs of the world. And so we became a partner with uh, Dragonfly in Miami. And I've been in charge of the program ever since and just, just loved it. So... From L and people say from elementary ed to adult training, but there's amazing amount of similarities. Um, right, you know, keeping keeping on sub keeping following their needs, um, listening to what they have to say, keeping them engaged. All those things are just good curriculum things, um, and so you know, good teaching is good teaching, and and I am loving doing that with adults. Right, because I think I I still even though you've taught so many adults from different careers i knew of your teaching your your background as a someone that helps teachers in particular in your history with teacher education but how has it been like with dragonfly where you have maybe some teachers in the program um some classroom educators but you might have other i guess informal educators or you might have pe people who are not working in education at all like mm. for you was that at all a step in your career or did it not really phase you? Um, in all honesty, I don't know that it did. Right from the beginning, I've had just not by design, but just the way it's always happened. I have about 50% of each incoming class teachers, formal educators, and the other 50% either informal educators are people looking to change careers. Uh, you know, they're business people right. uh, tired of being in the corporate world and wanting to change careers. Um, and into both both groups, I'm not teaching pedagogy to the teachers, but I'm teaching content to everybody. Um, and and so it it you know they're all there to learn about climate change and the climate change class. They're all there to learn um, about Great Lakes and the Great Lakes class. So it's it's content, not pedagogy that that we do. Right, and I think you also do such a good job of like finding other people as well to mm -hmm. in as a part of this experiential learning to have experts um you know come in and i know like with the great lakes you've done the trip to the indiana dunes national yeah, right. uh, park 
And um, I'm curious, like both, what are, what are some of your favorite sort of field trips? You've talked about McCormick place and the Indiana Dunes is really cool. Might to hear some more about that or other field trips you do. And then I'm also curious when you're just at the Brookfield zoo, like, do you have a favorite, like kind of exhibit place you go with the students that you think is just often really inspiring? Okay. Let me think there. So with Great Lakes Ecosystem, um, we do Indiana Dunes. We do um, Fort Sheridan, which is very unique in the ecosystems. Uh, ecosystems there, uh, in the in the ravines there, uh, you can't find anywhere until you're well into Canada. So it's a very unique ecosystem area. Um, in regional ecology, we are doing uh, three different three very different areas in Northern Illinois, looking at the plants and the ecology and the uh, geography of those areas. And so we have, we three out three days in, in regional ecology. Um, and, you know, I, I just, I just find them lovely, wonderful uh, because we're, we're able to tap into the expertise of these people and, and it's, they, they all bring their, their naturalists, they're the, for the park rangers, they are um, the people who day by day live and and work with and learn about each of those areas that that we are going to. And, and they have so much to share and they do it in such a wonderful way. Um, when we're at the zoo, because we're in the Chicago area, we are very blessed with some amazing resources around us. I have a couple speakers who come in from Argonne National Laboratory um, in climate change. In carnivores, um, I am I'm so thrilled with the uh, expertise we have right there at the zoo because um, I'm able to tap into our dietitian. I'm able to tap into our veterinarian staff. Uh, I'm able to tap into our keepers. I'm able to tap into the person who's in charge of the uh, enrichment programs for the animals. And so uh, students get to learn more than than this is a carnivore it's carnivores both in the wild and carnivores in human care and they get to see a whole different side of that and so it's all just really exciting and um i knock on wood i <laughs> have had really wonderful luck with people not only being experts in their area but being able to share their enthusiasm and their expertise um some of them have to zoom in uh, with uh, plants and people, one of the Zoom meetings that we had was with the University of Illinois with their RIPE, R-I-P-E program. And that's a program funded by the Gates Foundation where they are literally looking at how to increase productivity from individual seed grains. It's like, wow, far out. Um, and so, you know, there's just so much out there and, and we are hmm. blessed to be in the area that all this is available to us. So individual seed grains, like like uh, crops that yes, humans yes. are growing? Okay. Uh, soybeans. Uh, oh. Soybeans, they actually, they started their testing with tobacco, and they oh. quickly admit that tobacco is not something that the world needs more of, but it is a, it's a, 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 a seed that is easy to manipulate uh, and, and to start changing the genomes and and all the the complexities of that seed, uh, and what happens if you add more of this chemical, or it, what happens if the uh, plant is able to take in more oxygen? What mm. happens if the lower plants, the lower leaves on the plants, uh, can can have as much sunlight as the upper leaves on the plants simply by changing the leaf size? Uh, and and then so and now they have they have worked with that and now they're moving towards so they're working on soybeans um, and other cash crops and their hope is to be able to transfer this knowledge to Africa Southern Africa where you know feeding the masses is just becoming a critical issue. Yeah, so that's the you know in genetic engineering or genetically manipulated is is some people have quite a few concerns about. So I don't know if they're, they're doing that, but regardless, it's, it's something that may be just critical and important in some areas of the world. Right. So. Well, and we're projecting 9 billion people by yeah. the end of the century and somebody's got to figure out how to feed them. Right. Wow. Um, yeah. So I think it's, it's, it's amazing how you're able to connect people 
um, all these unique experts with the graduate students in the program. And um, I know, I don't have the exact numbers, maybe I'll try and pull it to for the introduction of how many students have been in the Chicago Brookfield uh, AIP. I remember it being quite a few. <laughs> and we would look at the map um, somewhere around 180 or 200 or so. So it's had quite an impact. W what is your thinking of the zoo? How does the zoo view this, this partnership? Um, others at the zoo, are they, I imagine you have some staff that at Brookfield Zoo that have gone through the program. And yeah, I have had staff go through the program. I was just looking at my stuff. Before we finish, I can give you the numbers I have. Um, I've had about a dozen staff go through the program. About half a dozen of our um, volunteers go through the program. Mm -hmm. And I think the zoo sees it as a wonderful partnership with a with a with a facility that also is focused on conservation and sustainability and making the world a better place. And so, you know, anytime we can partner with someone who has that same vision that we have, it's it's inspiring and wonderful. Nice. Well, I also, before we wrap up and, and that almost is kind of a perfect statement, but I know you're looking for your, for your numbers, but I also am curious. Um, and I had asked you about this. I feel like last time we were together at one of our meetings, but about your newspaper, column you had can you share on this i i find this so interesting and i always forget exactly where you were publishing um i want to say advice or something along those lines oh my word that's history <laughs> um wow that wow <laughs> i had almost forgotten that little face well that that was um back in quite a while ago when i was working not when teaching college classes was my part-time job and my full-time job was working with corporations in uh, a suburb here in, in Chicago area, working with corporations on um, how to, in, how to in, enhance their uh, benefits for their, for their employees by offering quality childcare. And that's back in the days when, when people were really needed in the employment and employers were really looking at what can we do to get good people. And so one of the things just as a byproduct of that is I wrote a column in the local paper about uh, parenting and, and good parenting skills, sort of like a uh, Ask Agnes type of column. You know, I, have, <laughs> I have a child who won't stop uh, screaming at bedtime. What do I do? You know, that type of stuff. So, so. I love that. How how many do you remember like how long or how many of those you did for about? Oh, about a year. Cool. Yeah, I think that's great because I I do feel like it connects to your personality in that you <laughs> are kind of like and even the way you teach is a bit like, you know, you're willing to offer some advice here and there, mostly to listen, I think. Um I don't know. I don't know if that's your it's kind of your teaching philosophy, but yeah, I, I think you've got it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> cool. Well, anything else you want to share before we we uh, wrap up? No, I, I just can't emphasize enough how wonderful the program is, and I uh, I really encourage anybody who's looking for a different approach to graduate school who is also interested in the planet and making a difference um, to at least look into the AIP program. We have what, nine uh, institutions across the United States offering this program. So wherever you are, we have something close for you. Um, and each and every one is just an amazing program. So um, look into it if you're, if you're at all interested. Right. And next week we'll, Agnes and, and and myself and some others will be going to the to the Bronx Zoo in New York um, to meet with all these other partners that um, you were just talking about. Agnes, these wonderful people from all the different zoos we work with and botanical gardens. Um, so yeah, so this is fantastic. It's nice to just spend a little time hearing a bit more about what's happening with um, Brookfield Zoo and the AIP. So thanks for joining and making the time. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Hi there, folks. Just one more thing before you head on out. If you have a moment, as I mentioned at the beginning, I would love to hear in what ways you are finding this podcast useful, how you listen, what you would like to hear more of, less of, etc. Please feel free to send me any and all feedback, any ideas for guests, etc. to Kevin Madison at 
my email, which is mattiskc at miamioh.edu. That's spelled M-A-T-T-E-S-K-C at miamioh.edu. Thanks again for listening. Have a great day.